Hello and welcome to this unique delve into the last century. Unlike the professional filmmakers of the 1900s, yesterday's amateur cameraman had a very different agenda. Amateur filmmakers tended mostly to record family events and perhaps a few other momentous milestones that everyone became involved in. In passing, these unique films have captured memories for us all to share. Times that so easily could have slipped by unnoticed and which now would be just hazy memories of happy days long ago. The Cotswolds are an easy road journey from Birmingham and in the late 1920s it was a relaxing one as well with hardly any traffic to spoil the pleasures of the open road. The delightful village of Stanton nestles under the edge of the Cotswolds, many of its mellow stone houses still lit by oil lamps. Motorbikes could get away with very smoky engines. Smoking is also part of the family scene, with the little baby just inches away from somebody's fag end. Nobody would have thought twice about it then. There'd be squeals of horror if it happened now. Home movies were something new, and standing posed, just like in a still photograph, made everybody feel rather self-conscious. Except Granny, in her amazing hat, who looks quite unfazed. The open road beckons again, with the lanes of leafy Warwickshire inviting exploration on a breezy spring day, although the little ones still have overcoats and gloves on. Typical England in May. As the family arranges itself in the middle of the road for another photo call, a fox fur dangles around mum's shoulders, something else that was once the height of fashion, but would certainly cause a lot of offence today. The motor car and the well-dressed family are typical of the rise of the British middle classes, something very characteristic of those interwar years. The horizontal line across the car windscreen marks where the upper part opened outwards. This tree-lined road, looking so rural and peaceful, is actually between Birmingham and Coventry. Windy weather again as a couple of lads cycle to work. Though this area is the heart of Britain's motor car industry, this is a 1927 Buick Saloon, made of course in America. Funny how fashions in names change. Young James and Elizabeth would be Jamie and Liz today, never Jimmy and Betty. Annual seaside holidays were another thing the middle classes could now afford, though in fact genteel Southport had been popular with the well-off since Victorian times. Children's all-in-one bathing suits were a unisex affair. The grown-ups, dressed rather elegantly, are quite happy just to have a chat. Another holiday haunt popular with people from the Midlands was North Wales, where the coastline is much hillier and rockier. After a morning on the beach, it's time to look for a picnic place. The main idea is to get out of that wind and find somewhere where sand won't get in everything. This'll do fine. No instant coffee or tea bags in those days, so you brought a thermos brewed at home, which always tasted a bit different by the time it got poured out. With the cine camera on, it's time for a bit of fooling around. 
How about pretending to be flappers on the hillside? Back home in Birmingham, with its imposing municipal buildings in the 1920s, the city still retained many of its old-fashioned gas street lamps. Not very much work was going on, as everyone, including schoolchildren, rushed outside to see an airship go over. No British airships flew after the R101 disaster in October 1930. A family visit to London town now, as the old buses with their outside staircases drive past the famous landmarks. The Houses of Parliament have scaffolding up. Not much new there. Whatever the occasion, everyone always wore headgear. Wide-brimmed hats for girls, school caps for well-brought-up boys, whether in term time or holidays, and a trilby for dad, with once again that dog hen dangling from the lips. One of the older generation has a very prosperous air. Colour film was on the market by the early 1930s, though at first, in the years of the Great Depression, few could afford it. This family had a successful business selling clothing and fabrics on higher purchase and were better cushioned against hard times. Hit your slow motion button to see how this is done. She's quite a comic, this one. By the mid-30s, the seaside was getting back to full prosperity, especially as holidays with pay were becoming the norm for working people. And a man on the pier without a hat. Now that's a sign of the times. Day trippers were coming by car, as well as by train and coach. As for the sea itself, well, that was as chilly as ever. Attractions on the prom include something called the radio rifle, three shots for three old pence, and a heavy-duty weighing machine. No secrets here, ladies. After the war, the new styles seemed so daring. Even the rubber bathing caps and brief swimsuits for both sexes. Behind the seafront gardens, where the older folks stroll, stands the Westminster Bank, long before its merger with the National Provincial. Child's play for this family from Oldham, Lancashire back in 1938, when tricycles were built to last. Not so sure about this one, though. Dad won't be popular if he busts it. That's Bruin. He'd be worth a pound or two if he was still with us now. The little girl has taken her mum to stay with her cousin and auntie in Chislehurst, Kent. Now here's a challenge for an up-and-coming performer. First you've got to get to grips with the instrument. Too true. A concertina. Now that's more my size. This is quite clearly a musical family. Let's hope Dad's better on the sax than he is on the tricycle. We presume that's Mum blowing the sax. Holiday time. 
and the family heads for Rill on the North Wales coast. Near a home, a visit to the park is always fun. Now it's playtime for another family in their back garden at home. All you need is a sister, a skipping rope and a strong pair of ankles. And Dad can do it too! This is Turin Road, Edmonton, North London in 1938 with the houses newly built and a lot to do for Mum and Dad making a garden from scratch. Now if a 10 year old were to smoke today, she probably wouldn't do it on Dad's video. Dad had better have it back. We don't want to get smoke in baby's eye. Wartime now and everyone digs for victory. It's potatoes in the front garden. Mum's a dressmaker, so she's able to save by running up cotton frocks for the family. June 1940. Invasion looks imminent and London children hurriedly assemble for evacuation. It's bye for now as the bus leaves for Paddington Station. And now here we are in Newquay in Cornwall. Some children lived with local families. Others stayed at the St Michael Hotel, which also did duty as a school. But Newquay is a holiday town, and in spite of feeling homesick, there was lots of fun to be had. Nowadays, of course, this is the surfing capital of Britain. More than 20 years after those childhood scenes, the same family enjoys a reunion at their new home in Raynham, Essex. Styles have changed a bit, and some people have put on weight, but everyone rocks along to the sounds of the 60s. That's the teenage son of one of the little girls who was playing in that garden. Could be the latest Beatles hit he's strumming. bit of swing for the older generation. That black and white telly is definitely not needed today. Come on everybody, sing along. We've got Aunt Dolly on the piano. And here's Aunt Dolly. Now for a bit of fun at Butlin's holiday camp at Filey on the bracing East Yorkshire coast. It's 1948 and people need cheering up a bit. The war's over but the peace is very uneasy with the Iron Curtain down across Europe and everyone edgy about Russia and the atom bomb. At home Clement Attlee's socialist government is in and these are days of austerity with shortages dragging on as Britain tries to get back on her feet. Petrol is still rationed and most people will have come here by train, steam of course. Filey Holiday Camp used to have a short branch line with its own station at the end. Holiday camps had started before the war as a quite upmarket venture, but their popularity peaked later when they set their stall out to attract a wider public. By the time of Heidi High in the 1970s, cheap flights abroad had taken a lot of the market, and in fact Filey was sold in the mid-1980s. Several of Britain's top entertainers started their career as a Butlin's redcoat, keeping everyone happy, whatever the weather. This group have been let out for the day, exploring the nearby coast, which is indeed very attractive. 
and up on the moors there are good bilberries to be picked. Starburst and Fanfare The keen home movie buff could have great fun creating Hollywood style titles, introducing a rather homelier subject. This photographer was a professional magician, and along with his friend, a professional artist, they came up with some great special effects. A classic Leyland coach crosses Barton Bridge over the Manchester Ship Canal on its way to Blackpool. And we head for Blackpool too, out along the old A584, past the windmill at Lytham St Anne's. This is 1949, and the car in front looks like a pre-war standard 10. New cars were very scarce, everything made was going for export. More jazzy special effects to introduce a lively place. The AA book at this period said of Blackpool, a popular resort with all amusements on a vast scale. The tower, built in 1894, rises to 518 feet just over half the height of Paris's Eiffel Tower on which it's modelled. One of the famous donkeys gets some special attention before its next turn along the beach. A simple, timeless pleasure for the young kiddies. Once just a little fishing village, Blackpool built its reputation on its seven miles of sandy beach. Plus, when the railways came in the mid-19th century, it's easy access from the industrial north. Popular with day-trippers from spring through to autumn, its busiest time was the wakes or holiday weeks in July and August, when whole towns in Lancashire and Yorkshire virtually shut down and emptied themselves onto the coast. Now we're in a horse-drawn cab viewing the Golden Mile. Named not from the colour of the sand or the fun it offered, but the amount of money it took. The Blackpool Illuminations became an annual feature from 1925, after having been stopped by the Great War. They extend the summer season into the autumn, boosting the town's takings and giving people something extra to look forward to before winter sets in. This couple, with their well-stuffed suitcase, are clearly saying goodbye to their landlady. They'd be back again next year, during the same week, and expect to have the same room, of course. And full marks for imagination as the tide comes in. And now we jump forward a bit in time, to the spirit of Christmas past. After summer holidays, Christmas was the next most popular subject for the home Sydney cameraman in those days. And why not? There's that special buzz and excitement about. Lots of crowds and traffic. And maybe people coming to your house you don't see very often. This is London, December 1958. And the last minute shoppers are out in force. Good old Woolies was much more of a household name then than it is today. And the Christmas displays tended to be more confined to the last few weeks, instead of starting in October, as happens more and more nowadays. Pull along toy dogs for the kiddies. Gift wrapping paper, halfpenny a sheet. Fresh flowers will cost something at this time of year. It's a raw day. Everyone's got their coats and scarves on. Mm, looks a bit spindly, even if it has got roots. This is a better one. Now Dad and Son can get busy decorating it. 
Most families would actually put their tree up a few days before Christmas Eve and take it down again on Twelfth Night, January the 5th. But the holiday break didn't run right through as it does for many now. Christmas Day and Boxing Day were bank holidays, but people working in public transport might be on duty even then. And New Year's Day wasn't made a holiday until 1978. That Jumper would be a spin-off from the Skiffle craze, which was actually on the wane by Christmas 1958, though Lonnie Donegan still had more hits to come. Crackers, tinsel and fairy lights weave a little magic in the corner of the living room. And coloured paper chains were all the rage for many years. This family's got an excellent collection of Christmas cards. And so the big day arrives. By 1958, there was no longer a delivery of post on December the 25th, but Father Christmas will surely have been on his rounds. And the family boxer is there to keep an eye on things. Never know when you might spot something to chew. Before the days of computers and battery-operated gizmos, children's presents were often board or dice games, or maybe books. <laughs> Bonzo's in luck again. Big Sister's in luck as well. A portable typewriter and a very handsome one too. The family's been careful not to stare at the camera, so we're getting some rather serious expressions. And now the festive bird. That's something about Christmas that hasn't changed, except that in the 1950s, Goose, the traditional Christmas fair, was still quite popular. Now this bird, which looks extremely well stuffed, is done to a sizzling turn. Hope the meal was as good as it looks. There's a lot of meat on those drumsticks. White linen tablecloth and fresh flowers add the finishing touch. The solid fuel stove would have heated the water as well as the room. And after the meal, the family gathers round it and tucks into fruit, biscuits and chocolates. Crackers! Another thing that hasn't changed is the jokes inside. The same ones must have been going since the very first Christmas. But the paper hats are always fun. That slap-up meal seems to have relaxed everyone. They're much less self-conscious in front of the camera now. So, it's time for some special Christmas cheer. There's various goodies on that drinks tray, and Dad has whistled up his favourite festive brew. <laughs> that cloth over the shoulder looks extremely professional. Cheers, everybody! Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year! In fact, the New Year, 1959, was to bring Cliff Richard to the top of the hit parade with Living Doll, a long hot summer of glorious weather, and the third conservative election victory in a row with Harold Macmillan telling everyone, you've never had it so good. Happy New Year all! We're stepping back a year in time now to the city of Liverpool, it's September 1957. There goes a Hillman Minx. And a Morris Minor, early variety. Behind it, in the central reservation, a tram. Advertising a well-known brand of orange squash, one of the last cars sets off along Edge Lane. 
In fact, this was the last week of Liverpool trams, which finished for good on Saturday, September the 14th, 1957. Away from the city centre, a number of Liverpool's tramways were laid on reserve track, often down the centre of the road, which has bequeathed us wide deal carriageways for today's traffic. It does seem amazing how empty the roads are. Though it's still the first half of September, it's noticeable that everyone's got their overcoats on. Autumn came early in 1957. And in fact, within days, Britain was to fall victim to a memorably severe outbreak of Asian flu, which closed schools and offices nationwide and threw the whole country off track for several weeks. And it was during that time, on October the 4th, that the Russians launched Sputnik 1 the very first satellite to be launched into space. The long shadows show that these scenes were filmed around breakfast time, as workers head for the city by bike, car and tram. No buses in view. Of course, buses replaced the trams after midnight on September the 14th. Rightly or wrongly, trams were seen as inflexible and the cause of congestion. While in Liverpool, the decision to go over to buses had been hastened by a disastrous fire in 1947 that destroyed no fewer than 66 trams in their depot. Britain's last big city tramway was Glasgow, which closed in 1962 leaving just Blackpool, which has never closed and is now a tourist attraction, as well as a public transport system. But trams, now linked with suburban railway lines, are coming back into favour, and it was Liverpool's neighbouring city of Manchester which pioneered the way in 1992 with its Metrolink system. Liverpool's tram car, number 293, is specially decorated for the last week of services, back in the nostalgic 1950s. The Catholic Church of St Francis, near the centre of Maidstone in Kent, celebrated this wedding one fine Saturday in 1963. Though many of these scenes look much like today, life at that time was more basic. None of the electronic gadgetry we now all take for granted, and also more scary with the Cuban Missile Crisis taking us to the brink of nuclear war. And we were just coming up to that social watershed we now call the Swinging Sixties. But for this couple, it was clearly a truly happy day. A Ford Zephyr provides the transport. The new model was then getting star billing in the TV series Z Cars. Traffic in the town centre threatens to delay the start of the reception. The couple have chosen the Highland Restaurant, or call it a cafe if you're in more casual mode. The choice of eateries in those days was still very limited and rather boring and British. Hardly anything continental or ethnic outside London. So we must hope their meat and two veg, or maybe cold buffet, was tasty and well cooked. At the car park it's time for the family to bid each other farewell. Mind that Ford Popular. Let's show off this outfit while the camera is out. Now for the journey home. Let's see if that new grouper on the radio. The Beatles, they're terrific. Bye all. It's been a great day. In spring 1963, 
Travel by rail was often still by steam train. At London's King's Cross station, the 6.25pm express is departing for Doncaster and Hull. The engine is one of those superb streamlined machines from the 1930s that many feel were the finest ever built in Britain. Nebworth, a commuter station, is 25 miles north of London on the main line. During the war, control of all the railways out of King's Cross was centred in this building to avoid the Blitz. A shrewd move, as the King's Cross area suffered heavily. It was in March 1963 that the infamous Beeching Report was published, speeding up a huge closure programme to try and stem the railway's mounting losses. But these drastic cuts created as many problems as they solved, and the railways seem to have been rarely out of the woods ever since. This is Sonning Cutting, on the Great Western Main Line near Reading, dug by hand by the great engineer Brunel's navvies way back in the 1830s. It was local people on stopping trains that were hardest hit by the cuts of the 1960s. Cheltenham South and Leckhampton were on the long vanished line from Cheltenham to Kingham. The young man, keen to stop the train, is off to start a new term at Cambridge University. Another thing on the railways we see less of nowadays is groups of men maintaining the track, the permanent way gangs as they're called. Modern, long welded track needs less maintenance and much of that is done by machine. But what happened to that familiar clickety clack? Steam engines were dirty machines and working on them was a hot and thirsty job. Every driver and fireman had his billy can with tea and a lot of sugar to replace lost energy. The lid served as a drinking cup. Champion. These old locos needed a crew of two and men had to come on duty hours before the first trip to help raise steam and oil round. It was the same at the end of the day, on duty long after getting back to the shed, clearing out ash, filling up with water and a dozen other jobs. Compare that with a diesel, which only needs one man, where you just switch on and go. Small wonder, really, that as the cost of wages rose higher and higher after the war, the need to do away with steam became more and more urgent. Drivers knew their regular routes like the back of their hand, and at one time would have known their regular engines too. A top link driver's job was something to be striven for working your way up from cleaner through fireman to local and shunting duties before going out on mainline expresses. These water troughs between the rails are only six inches deep but half a mile long. When the fireman of an express train lowered his scoop at 60 miles an hour he put 2,000 gallons of water into the tender in 20 seconds. Life on the locomotives was hard and dirty work and meant a lot of unsocial hours, all of which of course affected life at home, where long absences and endless laundry for the missus was the order of the day or night. But mostly the men loved the job and very often sons would follow in father's footsteps onto the footplate as it was known. The diesels offered a cleaner, easier environment but there were very mixed feelings when the last steam engines came out of service in 1968. Engine drivers today travel very much faster in cushioned comfort and usually unaccompanied, but the need for vigilance and good training is as great if not greater than ever. 
Such was the interest in steam locomotives that many can still be seen on Britain's plethora of preserved railways, where a new generation has had to relearn the old steam skills. Here's a diesel rail car. And here's a diesel on the seafront at Tynmouth in South Devon. A favourite spot for photographers and train spotters. You didn't have to be a number snatcher to enjoy watching the trains go by. But if you were, you sometimes got the thrill of a big cop. An engine not seen before. Watch the reaction of the lads on the left as City of Bristol passes. The Bournemouth Bell was one of the classic steam Pullman services. The magnificent Pullman cars date from the 1920s and a handful have survived to work on today's Venice Saint-Plan Orient Express. Holiday time now, with all the excitement of a long train journey to the south coast. Holidays or no, it's school caps for the boys. Destination, Exmouth. This family is here for a week at Whitsuntide, the old early summer holiday. Falling seven weeks after Easter, Whitsunday was a movable feast, and this year, 1961, it fell early, on the 21st of May. Exmouth was once a busy trading port, but now harbour and town are holiday centres with lots to do for the children. This is three-year-old Mary's first taste of candy floss, and she isn't keen. No worries, big sister will look after it. The traditional Punch and Judy puppet show keeps the little ones entranced. You don't see much of this now. Bashing the lady is not politically correct. The beach here is a winner, though it's quite a walk from the family's caravan site, and that's tiring for little children. In fact, with coming by train, a caravan holiday could be quite demanding for mum and dad. Two huge suitcases to carry, one for the family's clothes and one for bedding, which wasn't provided. By today's standards, the facilities here were decidedly basic with the toilet block hosed down each morning like a cattle shed. On its clifftop site, the caravan rocked about alarmingly in high winds, but the children loved the adventure of it all. On the table, there is the very latest technology, a transistor radio. Now, white overalls for driving a miniature steam engine don't seem very wise. Maybe it was a publicity stunt by some washing powder. For very many years, detergents were probably the most heavily advertised of all consumer products. Whatever, the setup looks trim and tidy, and so do the children on board. Notice too, not one t-shirt or pair of jeans in sight. He's looking after the tea kiosk. Round we go again. A ride on this train cost nine old pence in 1961, less than 4p in our money, but corrected for inflation, that would be around 60 pence now. Meantime, all the free rides in the playground are doing a roaring trade. Always much more fun than the boring old park at home.
Half-size road signs of the old-fashioned kind mark out a roadway for trikes and scooters, teaching the highway code from an early age. It's this youngster's first go on a tricycle. She has to learn what to do with her legs. Scooters were for years a children's craze that came and went, rather like skipping. But they weren't marketed at fancy prices like they are now. There's a megaphone on that table by the boating lake, ready for the boatman to call. Come in number 16, your time's up! It looks a glorious evening for a trip on the lake and Dad's surely working up an appetite for tea. Wembley Stadium, Saturday the 30th of July, 1966. The 60s didn't really start to swing till the middle of the decade and one of the things that got them going was our famous World Cup final. Who can forget the scoreline? England 4, West Germany 2, after extra time. Three years later, and the flags and the bunting are out again. This time, it's the Stars and Stripes in pole position, because we're celebrating an American spectacular, the first man on the moon. Happy landing, says the banner across this Liverpool street. It's July 1969, and on Sunday the 20th, the Apollo 11 lunar mission touched down on the moon's sea of tranquility. Neil Armstrong stepping out first, his fellow astronaut Buzz Aldrin following. Every household seems to have dug out some sort of decoration to help along their street party. Miniskirts were at their height, <laughs> so to speak. Here's a rocket all covered with tin foil. The school children and their teachers must have been extremely busy preparing all this, an ideal filler for the end of the summer term. While we're celebrating the moon, why not the sun as well? That spacesuit looks pretty warm for July. And of course, it's a great excuse for a feast for the children, with trestle tables down the street. Everyone dresses up and gets a prezi. Next, the sack race. Not sure if that spaceman's suit is much help for this. Nobly knees competition, <laughs> butlins all over again. Nice for the old folks just to sit in the sun and watch. In those last few months of 1969, there were signs that the swinging 60s had swung too far. One of the Rolling Stones rock group drowned in his own swimming pool. Then, when the same band played a festival in California, a fan was killed by Hell's Angels. But back home, it's all good fun, while over the next three years, five more missions would land ten more men on the moon. But for 30 years now, there have been no more. These children will be nearing middle age. Will they ever see another celebration like this? We're off to the Isle of Wight now, for a look at a piece of England which they sometimes say is like the mainland used to be 30 years ago. This group of tourists has come down by coach from Yorkshire, and they've made an overnight stop at the Strand Hotel in downtown Southsea, handy for the morning ferry. Portsmouth Harbour Station, where many more passengers are arriving to make the 25-minute crossing. At this period, summer 1970, the ferry across to Ryde was run by British Rail and there'd be a sailing every hour during the week 
with a lot more on summer weekends. Let's see if we can get a cup of tea. Another way you could make the trip was by hovercraft. These were one of those inventions that seemed very exciting when they first appeared, but never quite came up to expectations, being noisy, costly to run and prone to cancellation when the weather was rough. At Ride Pier Head, trains leave for resorts along the east coast. There used to be many more railways on the island, but they were all closed by the mid-60s. The electric trains, which still operate today, used to run on the London Underground. Now that all the old-fashioned surface carriages have gone, they're the only trains with a low enough profile to fit under the bridges and tunnels on the island. The Victorian Pier at Ride is half a mile long and stretches out over the shallows to allow ferries to berth at all states of the tide. Now it's time to join the coaches again and see a bit of the island. Our driver's done this trip countless times before. On the Esplanade stands the Southern Vectis bus terminal. Now here, at an address near Bembridge, a householder has created something a bit special with pebbles and shells. It makes a rather unusual tourist attraction. No charge to look round, ladies and gentlemen, but something in the charity box would be much appreciated. On the seafront near Ride, a pair of flared jeans tells us the 1970s are here. The weather is glorious. It's no accident that the Isle of Wight was one of the first parts of England to start producing wine again at about this period. The paddling Englishman with his trousers rolled up and his wife in tow were, as ever, a bit of a national joke. Out beyond the deck chairs, Ride Pier extends a long finger towards Portsmouth. By the 1970s, bikinis were well established, although topless bathing wasn't something that was tolerated on the average English beach. So it's new brief bikinis. <laughs> the times they are indeed are changing. Now, the Isle of Wight might once have been famous for royalty and yachting, but in 1970 it grabbed the headlines as never before or since. August Bank Holiday Weekend, and it's the Great Rock Festival, organised by local entrepreneurs, Fiery Creations. Our cameraman knew the people who mattered and could access all areas. It's still the heyday of great pop, and they came from everywhere to enjoy it. Europe, America, even Australia, and of course the UK. Hippies, straights, anyone young at heart and looking to be part of the scene. Nearly half a million of them. Amazingly, the sun shone the whole weekend and the island threatened to become one ginormous campsite. Need some poles for tents? Cut a few trees down. This was Southern Vectis Bus's finest hour. The festival site, just outside Freshwater, was over in the west, the other end of the island from the ferry terminal at Ride. Drugs? Wisely, the police moved in on only the most blatant cases. And squalor? Who cares, it's only for a few days. The Alternative Society ruled, OK. The extreme left, mods, rockers, the bikers, anything, so long as it wasn't establishment. And from Afton down, thousands more looked down on the site and saw and heard the action without paying a penny to get in. 
They reckon up to half a million people were here. But the whole thing became so chaotic, nobody really knew. They still don't. Somebody nicknamed this place Devastation Hill. The lineup looked sensational. Top of the bill, Joan Byers. Next, Jimi Hendrix, who was to die in less than three weeks. Then The Who, Joni Mitchell, Chris Christopherson, Jethro Tull, Donovan, Sly and the Family Stone, This is the Moody Blues in action. In fact, Fiery Creations booked too many bands. The schedules collapsed each night, and some acts didn't get to start till 2 or 3 in the morning. By that time, artists and audience alike were way out, man. The sea and the cliffs were just a mile or so away. Many hundreds headed in particular for Compton Bay, there to display their all for anyone who happened to be around. The world's press came along too, looking for photo opportunities. <laughs> they weren't disappointed. It was actually all pretty good humoured and never quite got out of hand, but they were lucky and this was to be the last of the great rock festivals. This was the time when scooters were all the rage, and it's motor scooters this time, not the child's push-alongs we saw earlier. On your 16th birthday, it was on with the L plates and off to join the mods, at least in your imagination. This group of lads learnt to ride their Vespers around the roads of Lincolnshire. Along with the Italian-style transport goes an Italian-style jacket. Nobody was much bothered about helmets then. And the little ones seemed quite safe near the road. That's a Lambretta, which some people claimed were the best. Granny lends a hand. Dad was a policeman, so a police jam sandwich was parked outside. Take care now. By this period, car ownership had become the rule rather than the exception, and this new housing now included a built-in garage as a matter of course. This is Wickford in Essex. These ladies have a visitor from the north who's come down in his Vauxhall Viva. By now the MOT test had cleared most old bangers off the road and their modern replacements were far more reliable and comfortable. But they were starting to look rather the same. Petrol, then, was around 34 pence per gallon. Here we are, sir. Four, three or two star. Attendant service, of course. Green shield stamps and a free tumbler with every six gallons. This was the time when England swings, according to Roger Miller's song, and nowhere more so than swinging London itself. Tourists were over here in record numbers, while British fashion and British pop music seemed to give our traditional sights a newly fashionable spin. David Lean's film Ryan's Daughter, showing at Piccadilly Circus, fixes this scene firmly in spring 1971. The film, set in Ireland, provoked heated discussion, as the troubles in Ulster were now daily headlines, with the British Army heavily involved. Drink seems to fill a good part of Piccadilly's advertising space. We'd have been counting our change carefully in the pub. For just that February, our money had gone decimal. Tobacco advertising was still comparatively unrestricted.
This multicoloured display mimics the strobe lighting of London's discotheques, then still excitingly fashionable. A French onion cellar, complete with bicycle, beret and Goulois cigarette. The King's Road Chelsea SW3, centre of the universe for outrageous style. Hot pants, shorter even than miniskirts. If you've got it, why not flaunt it? At times, it seemed like there was a foreign news crew on every other street corner. Carnaby Street had suddenly come from nowhere to be the most fashionable shopping street in the world. Chanting as they go, a Hare Krishna group hurries along Oxford Street. The recipe for less lust, if you want it, will cost you five pence. Is it the Bible this man's thumping? Possibly. It's Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, so it could be anything. Here, for generations on Sunday afternoons, just opposite Marble Arch, orators have held forth, and the tradition here is that free speech, however provocative, is always allowed. The police can relax. They know many of the speakers are harmless crackpots. On his soapbox, Lord Soper, famous Methodist preacher. The professional mickey takers are enjoying themselves. And now, sadly, the end is indeed nigh for our look at life the way it was. We hope you've enjoyed making the trip with us. Bye for now. It's been a great day. <laughs>